Canada is known across the world for exporting some of the best maple syrup in the world. But little did you know that it also is known for exporting the highest quality uranium and also nuclear power reactors. Yes, I know you weren't expecting that. This beautiful country is home to the most innovative and advanced nuclear reactor technologies which support research, power production, and production of life-saving radiomedical isotopes. In this video, I'll share the forgotten story of how Canada over the past few decades became that tier one nuclear nation and also leader in the international nuclear energy industry. Hey friends, my name is Osama. I have a background in nuclear engineering and on this channel, I help demystify nuclear technologies by simplifying them. I also share some really cool stories like this one going through the history of a nation like Canada and especially when it comes to its nuclear power reactors. So let's dive into this video. Let's start off at the very beginning and the story starts at in the United States with the development of the first experimental nuclear reactor called Chicago PAL-1. Now Chicago Pal 1 was being developed by an Italian scientist called Enrico Fermi. At the same time, Nobel laureate Ernest Rutherford's student, John Krakow, came to Canada to direct the Montreal Laboratory to design and build a Canadian test reactor. Luckily for Canada, John Krakow had experiences at the Chicago Pal 1 site. With Enrico Fermi's successful experiment and birth of the world's first nuclear reactor, you'll see countries across the world like Soviet Union, Britain, and Canada racing to develop similar technologies. This technological race would inspire these nations to take their own unique approaches when it comes to development of nuclear power technologies. The United States decided to focus its capabilities and technological development on uranium enrichment. And the reason why is because enriched uranium is best suited for compact reactor types like that of for submarine propulsion applications. Using enriched uranium in these reactors comes with the benefits of not having to refuel very often for long periods of time. And this is ideal for submarines because you know, they're at the bottom of the ocean. These very same submarine reactor types were then taken and sized up for commercial large-scale applications. So instead of powering submarines, they were now powering cities. And you'll see that this reactor type called the PWR or pressurized water reactor is still the most popular reactor type found across the world. Nations like Britain, on the other hand, had their own challenges, such as not having enrichment facilities or having access to heavy water. Thus, they'd focused on the development of graphite moderation capabilities for their power reactors. And similarly, the Soviet Union took the same approach. So you'll see Great Britain with that of the Magnox design and the Soviet Union uniquely came up with the RBM case. Canada, on the other hand, played a very important role in the development of heavy water technologies and heavy water research, and also played an important role in supporting wartime efforts. Hence, Canada built upon this expertise by choosing to develop a reactor design that used heavy water moderator instead of light water. And this heavy water moderator would be paired up with natural uranium instead of the conventional enriched uranium. Ultimately, this led to the development of the great great grandfather of the Kandu reactor called the ZEEP or the Zero Energy Experimental Pile Reactor, which was located in Chalk River, a location which is around two hours north of Ottawa. The ZEEP was Canada's very own version of the Chicago Pile 1, which was developed by Enrico Fermi. As World War II was launched, it came with the recent German discovery of nuclear fission. And ahead of the German invasion, several French scientists were able to escape Paris to Britain with a vast majority of the world's heavy water, which was around 200 kilograms at the time. Eventually, both the French scientists and the heavy water ended up in the Canadian city of Montreal, which then played a very important role in helping Canada develop its internal capabilities around heavy water physics and research. As Canada played an important role in assisting the United States in the research for its atomic bomb program, the end of World War II left Canada with the second largest nuclear research infrastructure in the world, second to that of the United United States itself. Fast forward to the 1950s where George Lawrence would become an advocate for Canada to develop its own power reactor technology. This reactor would run on both natural uranium and heavy water since these were two areas of expertise for Canada at the time. Uniquely, Canada was the only country in the British Canadian American Nuclear Alliance that chose not to pursue the development of atomic weapons. Hence why Canada found itself lacking technical cooperation from its other allies and thus it was forced to go alone in the development of its own nuclear power reactor expertise. Remember, nuclear power reactor technologies are very different from that of nuclear weapons technologies. And maybe I'll deep dive a bit into this topic in another video. In 1951, the atomic power proposal was published. This proposal played a really important role in leading several feasibility studies in collaboration with several important organizations in Canada, such as AECL or Atomic Energy Canada Limited, Ontario Hydro, or also known as the Hydroelectric Commission at the time, the NRC or the 
National Research Council, and lastly, government support from the Ontario Premier and the Federal Minister. So you'll see that corporations alongside government were working together in conducting these feasibility studies. This is also the spark that enabled AECL to work jointly with representatives from electric utilities, engineering firms, and manufacturers to design a prototype heavy water moderated natural uranium fueled power reactor, which can cost competitively compete with coal fired power plants. Yes, that's quite the challenge, but they did it. In 1955, General Electric Canada would become the prime contractor providing the design work for the NPD or nuclear plant demonstration reactor. Next, Ontario Hydro would play the role of providing a site for the plant, also the secondary systems of the plant, so the turbines and the conventional non-nuclear side, and would play the role of operating the reactor unit. Lastly, AECL played the role of providing funding for project costs, which is around $20 million, which if you go to 2022 dollars is around $214 million. Yeah, it's a big difference. Also, you'll see that AECL would own the nuclear side of the power plant. Canada uniquely chose a 100% Canadian manufactured approach for its prototype reactor. This fully self-reliant strategy would also reflect on future iterations of Kandu reactor designs. Hence why you see the Kandu reactor made up of hundreds of smaller horizontal pressure tubes rather than a large reactor pressure vessel, which you can see in American designs. The reason why is because the country at the time, Canada, didn't have the manufacturing capabilities to produce these large pressurized vessels. Rather, smaller pressure tubes were more easy easily manufactured. However, for the NPD or the nuclear plant demonstration prototype, the Calandria, which is the vessel that's non-pressurized and holds the pressure tubes, was outsourced to a firm in Scotland. On June 4, 1962, the NPD reactor would operate at full power, around 20 megawatts of electricity. 20 megawatts is enough electricity to power 10,000 homes. Yes, that's a lot of homes for a prototype reactor. And it would continue to operate like this for the next 25 years. The NPD was more importantly a testbed to try out new fuel types, test components, and also instrumentation, and ultimately become a center to train the future of the Canadian nuclear industry and workforce. The legacy of the NPD reactor was a considerable accomplishment for the Canadian nuclear industry. It surpassed every single goal set for the reactor prototype. So it was both a success and a considerable milestone for the Canadian nation. Next, Canada's first commercial scale nuclear plant was built in Tiverton, Ontario, and was yet another considerable success for the industry. Although the NPD reactor was the testing of a conceptual design and prototype, the Douglas Point Station established the Kandu reactor by supplying 10 times the amount of power output as compared to the NPD reactor, and this would provide a significant contribution to Ontario's electricity mix. Starting commercial operations in the year 1968, Douglas Point would continue to push around 220 megawatts of clean electricity into the Ontario grid for the next 16 years. Slowly, as operators applied lessons learned from the NPD prototype reactor, Douglas Point in turn would also improve its performance year after year. Also, interestingly, Douglas Point was the first of its kind reactor to deploy programs, computer programs, to run a full-out nuclear power reactor. Integration of fully computer-controlled systems would next be deployed at the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station, which was the next commercial can-do to be developed after the Douglas Point Station. Douglas Point was an important milestone for Canada, as it symbolized Canada's advancement of its nuclear power program and also international capabilities of exporting this reactor. Even before Douglas Point Station was completed, Canada had three orders in the pipeline from international markets requesting an order of three Douglas Point type reactors. Pretty interesting. The NPD and Douglas Point both symbolize excellence in collaborative efforts that come from joint cooperation between federal and provincial governments and also private research and development. Partnerships that were developed by AECL and Ontario Hydro became standardized models which were adopted by other provinces like Quebec and New Brunswick who went on to build their very own CANDU reactors, such as John Tilly and also Point the Pro. This story also translates into the formation of one of the world's most robust and independent nuclear supply chains through which construction, engineering, design, research takes place to this day. At the moment, Canada has 19 operating power reactors across four generating stations. Nuclear energy also makes up around 15% of Canada's electricity mix, and this number is bound to grow in the future with small modular reactors and advancements to these other power reactor technologies. There are also 11 Kandu reactors that are operating in countries across the world. Kandu is an exceptional legacy and truly an innovative reactor design. Really enjoyed sharing the history of Canada's entry into the Canadian nuclear industry. Well, if you want to check out some of my other Kandu reactor videos, you can watch them right here. We well, hope you enjoyed. Thanks again. Take care. Bye.